Okay, read the Bible. Preach. Okay. Now, his older son was in the field, and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. He said to him, your brother has come because he has received him safe and sound. Your father has killed the fatted calf. Now, this part of the message is where I want to tell a denominational joke, uh, but I can't because people are a little touchy. They get offended and then they send me dumb emails. So I will not talk about any denominations, but whatever denomination it is, that's the one that the son was a part of because he was angry that they were singing and dancing. But he... <laughs> it's good to be back, guys. <laughs> But he was angry and would not go in. Therefore, his father came out and pleaded with him. Let's take a pause. Anybody grateful for a father that when you won't go in, he'll come out and get you? And by the way, please don't be ignorant enough to think that you chased God. Before you could go looking for him, he came looking for you. It says he came out and he pleaded with them. So he answered and said to his father, Lo, these many years I have been serving you. I have never transgressed your commandments. He said, Dad, I've always obeyed you. I've never sinned. And Murray discovered that was a lie. At any time, and yet you never gave me a young goat that I may make merry with my friends. But as soon as his son, this son of yours, came, you devout, who devoured your livelihood with harlots, you killed the fatted calf for him. He said to him, son, you're always with me, and all that I have is yours. It was right that you should make merry and be glad, for your brother was dead and is alive and was lost and is found. Hey, let's pray. Father God, we're grateful. God, that you're the father that comes running out to get us. God, that even after we take just one step towards you, you're throwing a cloak of righteousness around us. You're putting your ring of authority on our finger. You're, you're throwing a party of covenant with us. We're grateful that we get to call you father. The Bible says in Romans that you've given us a spirit of adoption by which we say, Abba, Father. So, Father God, on this Father's Day, we celebrate amazing fathers, but we celebrate you because it's in you that we've been created, designed. It's your DNA that's running through our bodies. God, we pray in this moment that you'd speak, that you'd heal, that you'd deliver. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And amen and amen. Anybody who's ever heard me preach before, you know that I'm always talking about my kids not always in the best way, uh, which is getting a little dicey because they watch online now. And uh, I got to be really careful what I say. Uh, they, they broke into my closet this morning and said, Daddy, 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 Happy Father's Day. And they had this little art that they made. And it was the most hideous thing I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> <laughs> their mom is so mad at me. <laughs> they outlined their hands and they wrote, Daddy, I, I love you. And, and they gave me this, like, Daddy, Dad, you got to put it up for everybody to see. And I said, yeah, I'm going to put it up right here in the closet. Everybody's going to be able to see it in the closet. <laughs> Pray for me. I still need Jesus. Jesus is still working on me and you don't have a sense of humor. But anyway... <laughs> I, I, I have a five-year-old. Her name is Zoe, and she'll tell you I'm not five. I'm five and a half. I'm five and a half. That half really matters to her because her brother is four, and she feels like he's catching up with her. So she's like, no, 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 no. I'm five and a half. And I have a 10-month-old. Her name is Jade Mariah. I had a very difficult, confusing conversation with my oldest Zoe a few months ago. She came to me, and, and, and she's just full of life, always laughing, always joking. But she just looked really serious. She said, Daddy? I said, yeah, baby girl. I said, are you my daddy? I said, well, that's what your mama told me. And uh, <laughs> the last I checked, I was. <laughs> Why? <laughs> and she said, um, and um, is Pop-Pop's? My granddad, I said, yeah, Pop-Pops is your granddad. And is Pop-Pops your dad? 
I said, well, that's what he told me. And uh, last I checked, I have no reason not to believe him. She said, so, so that makes you pop up son, right? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. She's like, how can you be my daddy and his son at the same time? She, she's like confused. And I was like, well, I was his son before I was your daddy. Actually, he taught me how to be your daddy. She said, oh. I said, you really want to get crazy? She said, what, daddy? I said, you know, Uncle Patrick, I'm his brother. <laughs> this just, just blew her mind. <laughs> she said, you're, you're a dad? You're a son? And you're a brother? She said, daddy, this is a lot. I said, yeah, it's expensive, too. I said, then, then what are you to mommy? I said, oh, I'm her sugar daddy. That's, that's. <laughs> pray for me. Pray for me. I've been off for four weeks. I'm, I'm coming back. I need to get a little bit more pastoral. <laughs> pray for the pastor. He needs more Jesus than he currently has. <laughs> I said, yeah, 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 yeah. I said, and you know what? I'm a pastor. I'm a friend. She's like, daddy, that's a lot. Daddy, how do you do all that? And I says, well, it, it depends on what room I'm in and who I'm around of what role I play. She said, daddy, it's, I just want you to be my daddy. I said, well, you got a lot of other people you got to talk to about that because... <laughs> And in her five-year-old mind, she couldn't understand that her father had different roles, different parts, different pieces to his identity. Matter of fact, she was learning that there were parts of her father that she never knew and that she had yet never encountered. Here's a thought that crossed my mind, that as we are able as children of the Most High God, to say that God is our Father. The Bible says in the book of Romans that, that, that when you pray the prayer of salvation, when you surrender your life to Christ, when you make him the Lord of your life, you don't just become a Christian. That's not the moment of church membership. That's the moment of spiritual and legal adoption. It's as if you're standing before a judge and the creator of the universe says, that child now has my last name. I'm responsible for them. They are a part of my family. The Bible says that the Holy Spirit gives us the ability to say, Abba, Father. God is your father. But here's what you need to understand about your father, God. That there are many attributes to who he is. And your experience here on earth will be predicated on how much of the Father you know of and are in relationship with. Somebody say amen. amen. For example, the children of Israel, they were in slavery in Egypt. God came through Moses. He delivered them. He parted the Red Sea. He brought over three million people across the Red Sea. When they got on the other side, they realized it was a desert and there was no food. So the Bible says that God brought Krispy Kreme donuts in the morning and Chick-fil-A nuggets at night. At least that's what my Bible said. And the church said, now the Bible calls it manna and quail, but you get it. It's all the same thing. Somebody say he delivered them and he provided for them. So they knew Father God as a deliverer and a provider. But watch this. When God wanted to increase the relationship, and he said, come up on Mount Sinai so I can reveal myself to you. Israel said, oh, no, heck no. We don't want to get close to you. Because our perception of a God is a God that's unreasonable and only has harsh expectations and is not for the people, but is against the people. So they said, send Moses up. We want no part of it. And because they did not encounter the power of God on that mountain, they were never able to go into the promised land that God had for them. They were able to come out, but they were never able to go in. The amount of God that you have been revealed to will dictate whether your life is only a life of coming out and needing or a life of going in and abundance. 
Come on, somebody say, there's more to my father than I thought there was. This story here about the prodigal son, it's one of the more popular stories in scripture. If you've never heard it, the, the religious folks of, here, here's what happened. The dream team cornered Jesus. Parking team, comm team, kids team, they got Jesus in the corner. And, and, and he started just telling stories, parables. And he said, here's what I desire the kingdom of God to be like. He said, it's like a rich man with two sons. He had an older son and a younger son, Flowers. And it said the younger son came to his father and said, I want my inheritance now. And the whole room gasped. Why? Because you only get your inheritance when your parents die. So this younger son looked his father in the eye and he said, I wish you were dead. And his dad said, you don't have to wait. Here you go. And he gave him his inheritance. Now, in that time, the oldest brother, the firstborn son, just to clarify, would get two-thirds of their father's wealth. By the way, that's a biblical principle. Who much is given, much is required. He was given two-thirds of the father's wealth because when the father passed away, it was his responsibility to take care of the entire family. Hey, be careful coveting what other people have because what they have comes with responsibility. And that's not even in the sermon notes. Anyway, so the youngest son gets one-third of all his father's wealth. He goes off. He goes to Vegas and just completely wasted. And he finds out that what happens in Vegas doesn't stay in Vegas. It follows home with you. And anyway, <laughs> he had all the friends when he had the money. As soon as the money was gone, the friends were gone. And he found himself working in a pig's pen, which his culture considered unclean. The Bible says he came to his senses. If only he could read the Bible, we'd live a much better life. This guy had a conversation with himself. Some of y'all problem is you don't talk to yourself enough. If you would just talk to yourself more, you, you'd be seeing life moving where you wanted to move. So, somebody lied and told you that talking to yourself makes you crazy. No, losing an argument with yourself, that's what makes you crazy. But normal people talk to themselves all the time. He's talking to himself and he said, the servants in my father's house are treated better than I'm being treated right now. Let me go back and apologize to my father and say, I don't deserve any longer to be a son. Let me be a servant in your house. So he practices his speech. He goes on home. And as soon as his father sees him in the distance, the Bible says that his father takes off running towards his son. You've got to understand it was considered uncommon. It was considered lowly for a Jewish man to run, which means this father cared about his son more than he cared about perception. I don't care about keeping up appearances. My boy is coming home. He runs towards his son and his son starts his speech. Dad, I met. His dad cuts him off, throws a cloak around him, put a ring on his finger, throws a party, says my son was dead and now he's alive. He was lost and now he's found. This isn't the message, but let me preach it for a second. There is no distance you can run away from God that would make him stop looking for you. And watch this. He going to let you run. He ain't going to chase you down. But the second you take one step towards him, he is ready. That cloak represents righteousness. I'm going to cover over the mud and the scratches and all the things that show the life you used to have. And people are only going to see the son that you are now. That ring represents authority. He didn't wait for him to prove his forgiveness. He said, the same authority that I have, you have. And that banquet represented covenant. I've made a commitment to this son that he is mine and I am his. The older brother's upset. He's bitter. He wasted all your money and you're throwing a party for him. I've been here faithfully and you haven't even given me as much as a goat to have a party with my friends. Here's the thing that struck me. The oldest, the youngest son went and party. The oldest son stayed home and dreamed about a party. But they both had the same heart. I don't want what my father has. I want something else. Here's a thought that came to my mind. We may have heard this message preached over and over and over and over again. You've heard about the prodigal son. You can't go too far that the father won't bring you back. 
We've even heard about the bitter older brother. You, you, you can be in God's house and still angry. You can be in God's house and still bitter. But, but here's just me, a message I've never heard. What was wrong with the father and oldest son's relationship? That the oldest son didn't even know who his father was. He said, Dad, you have never given me anything. And his dad says, are you kidding me? Do you not know me? All of this is yours. The message today is called The Father I Never Knew. The Father I Never Knew. And hear me, your revelation of who God, your heavenly Father is, will dictate your existence here on earth. You will live a life with access to more than you can imagine and not being able to touch it just because you don't know how awesome and how amazing your heavenly father is. Three quick thoughts, three quick thoughts. I've been gone for four weeks, but I still preach in threes. Here we go. First one is this. Everything is built on this relationship. You, you, you've got to understand your, your money, your marriage, your kids, your faith, you're really, the impact you will have here on earth is all built on one thing, and that is your perception of Father God. I, 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 I was about to say, I, I grew up super saved, but, but that's not true. It, I was just sheltered. I, I, I kind of just grew up in one of them super safe places. My parents were pastors longer than alive. I, I was homeschooled, grew up on focus on the family, all this other good stuff. And, and we, <laughs> some of y'all were raised just like me. <laughs> that means y'all know who Sandy Patty is. It was a great come. <laughs> anyway, inside show. But, but I, I grew up going to this after school program called Awana. Some of some y'all y'all grew up just just like I did, and um, it, 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 it was like a VBS that never ended. It was just every week on a Wednesday you would go at like six p.m. and it was kind of like it, it, it. Just picture this: it was like Boys and Girls Scouts of America, but but for Christians. So you would go and you would memorize Bible verses and you would have to do good deeds and all that other good stuff. And every time you did that, you would get like a pin on your vest. So when you memorize the Ten Commandments, you got the Ten Commandment pin and, and your chest just went out a little bit further. And then when you were able to recite all 66 books, you, you got another pin and your, your, your chest would go out a little bit further. I, I went, every time I would recite, I would pick this old gentleman who was serving there and he was amazing, but he was old and not, he, he would open the book and have it right flat in front of him and say, go ahead and recite the verse. And I said, okay. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not. I learned how to read upside down. Pray for me. God, God was still working on me. But it came this faithful day when I was graduating from the elementary class to the middle school class. I, I was no longer a sparky. I was going to pals. And I'll never forget, I went to the Sparky class and they came and it was like this ceremony. You take off your vest because Sparky's wore a vest and pals, they had a button up shirt and I took my vest off and, and I got my button up shirt and I put all my pins on there and, and I waved at my friends. I, I'll see y'all later. I'm going on to pals and, and I walked across the church to the other classroom and, and when I walked into that pals room, it must be the same feeling you feel when you walk into the prison yard for the first time. Never been in prison, but it's what I can imagine. There's like a fifth grade, a sixth grade boy in the corner on a bench, just, I mean, just throwing it back. Had his shirt off, had Jeremiah 1 5 tattooed on his stomach. I'm like, this is, this is intense. A group of friends over there, y'all can find, I watch too much TV, pray for me. Proof friends, I mean, it, it was just, and nobody looked at me. Nobody talked to me, and I'm like, okay, okay, okay. It's my first day. Can't get punked. All right, I got to prove I'm the man. I, I mean, this is, this is dangerous. <laughs> so I walk in there, I said, I'm the fastest person in this room. I don't know who was listening. I just yelled, I'm the fastest person in this room. Room goes silent. <laughs> What'd you say? I gotta understand. I was probably like five foot three, 65 pounds, dripping wet, but had enough mouth for it. 
You heard me. The fastest person in this room. Everybody looks at one guy. He said, no, you're not. I am. This is my classroom. Y'all gotta understand. I'm just... It was... Hope you enjoyed your rain. <laughs> it's so funny because I, I told this first service and I mentioned the person's name and somebody from Awan is like, I know him. I'm going to tell him you're preaching about him. <laughs> you can tell him now. I'm still faster than him. I said, what's your name? I said, Stephen Chandler. He said, I'm Paul Rattray and I'm faster than you. I said, no, you're not. And the whole room said, prove it. Yeah, and it just murmurs all around the yard. Prove it. 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 <laughs> Listen, my heart is beating out of my <laughs> head. And, like, and luckily, the, the, the event for that night was a relay race. So we go to the gym, and it's one of those deals where, where, where you, you run around a circle. Because when I signed a track, it was like just a kind of a tight circle, middle of the gym. So we got a relay race, and, and he was on the other team. I, go, I said, I'm running anchor. This is, new kids never get to run anchor. You're not running anchor. Paul Rattray says, he's running anchor. You heard the man. The last day he's ruling, he just told y'all what's going on. I'm running anchor. So anchor goes. They do the, you know, the three people in front of us. And, and I get the baton right about the same time he gets the baton. And you, you got to understand, ego will motivate you faster than talent and muscle ever could. <laughs> I, mean, it, I mean, I lose this race. My name's Mud for life. I fly around this track. This was before people were concerned about little dumb stuff like concussions and all that other good stuff. So it wasn't like a finish line you ran across. They had a pin and a bean bag in the center of the circle. You would do one lap, you would turn inwards, and then the first person to get the pin was first place and bean bag was second place. So me and Paul turned the corner at the same time, running full speed, at this pin. Now, you may not know a lot about me. Pastor, let me explain. I, I don't lose. I don't lose. I may cheat, but I don't lose. I just, <laughs> I just, I just the only reason you're mad that I cheated is because you didn't think of it. But anyway, <laughs> so we're going at this pin, and I'm just like, my name is on the line. Y'all, I stretch out like David Beckham, Odell Beckham. I got the pin. We collide heads, and I mean, just flat on the floor. He's gushing blood. I'm like dizzy. Room spin. Y'all, he went to the ER and got stitches. I just had a little bump. That's because he was soft. And uh, <laughs> and I was right. It was my classroom for that moment on. But here's the thought that crossed my mind. You remember back in school when you would say something crazy? And everybody would be like, prove it. I could jump across this creek. Got your brand new school clothes on. I could jump it. Prove it. I, I could climb to the top of this. Prove it. I'm smarter than you. Prove it. And I feel like we walk out of these buildings every Sunday saying, I'm a lover of God. And the world is saying, prove it. You, you, you got to understand, nobody's going to take your word for it. Because a lot of people pretending to be stuff on Instagram that they ain't really... Rich, doctors, Christians. There's a lot of people on Instagram pretending to be stuff that they're not. So you can say it, but the world's response is... By the way, you know what God's response is? Prove it. No, no, no. no, no. He, 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 he said even unbelievers say, Lord, Lord. He said, no, no, I need to see some proof in your life that, that you have a relationship with the Father. And, and if you're like me and you were raised in church, you're like, oh, I could prove that I'm a Christian. Look at my attendance record. I've been in church my whole life. Went to church with the chicken pox. I was in church so much, I've been in some services that God wasn't even at. <laughs> the longest service of my life. <laughs> Come on now. Oh, I love God. Look at my tithing record. You can pull my tithing record and you can see how much I love God. You kidding me? I serve two services every single Sunday. I've been serving longer than the church has existed. 
And what we point to prove that we're lovers of God is what the Bible calls dead works. Oftentimes, not that there's anything wrong with giving. The Bible says to, not that there's anything wrong with serving. The Bible says to, but the Bible says, why are you doing it? Are you doing it because of the guilt and shame of your past and you're trying to make up for your mistakes? Or is it an overflow of your love for the Father? The Bible says, actually, you can prove your love for God. First John chapter 4, verse 20, it says this. If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. One of the things I like about scripture is it doesn't have any loopholes. It's not like our tax system. We make sure that there's no loopholes. <laughs> I'm having too much fun. As soon as the Bible says, whoever hates their brother doesn't love God, everybody who considers themselves somewhat religious says, oh, that's me. I don't hate anybody. Look what it goes on to say. No, 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 no. It's not just about hate. For he who does not love his brother. No, no, not do He who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? Watch this. How I treat you proves my relationship with him. If you want to know how much your pastor really loves God, watch how he treats the waiter or waitress at the restaurant after church. The Bible says, here's a proof of your relationship with God. How do you treat one another? Uh, Somebody said, I I love them. I just don't like them. You know what? I understand. I'm just having too much fun. I just love the Bible because it doesn't let you come up with stuff on your own. It says, I need you to love your brother if you really love God. And let me tell you what love is. Just in case you want to make up some definition of love, that's not really what love is. He says, here's what love is. Love is very patient. As soon as I saw this verse, I got really mad. And I didn't want to preach this message. Because I'm not very patient. (laughs) It says, love is very patient and kind. Love is never jealous or envious of somebody else. Sonia, can I have fun? I don't know why you would need a house that big. I mean, why would you live there? It's just you and your four kids. I mean, uh, why would you drive that? I would never wear that. The Bible says love is never jealous or envious. It's never boastful or... You ever been around people that can only talk about themselves? And I mean, just... (laughs) I'm having too much fun. Like, you'll have a 30-minute conversation with them. They did all the talking. It's all about their accomplishments, their kids' accomplishments, and what they're going to do next. And then they leave or hang up the phone. Oh, good talk. (laughs) That, my friend, was not a talk. That was a monologue, and I checked out in the first three minutes. It says, love is never boastful or proud. It's never haughty, selfish, or rude in the return line at Target. Love does not demand its own way. It's not irritable or touchy, which means love always gets eight hours of sleep and does not have three kids under five years old. It does not hold grudges and will hardly even notice when others do it wrong. It is never glad about injustice, regardless of its political party but always rejoices whenever truth wins out. If you love someone, you will be loyal to him no matter what the cost. You will always believe in him, always expect the best of him, and always stand your ground in defending him. That's hard. And the Bible says that's what it means to love God. When I can treat somebody else like that. The older brother's issue with his younger brother wasn't actually an issue with the younger brother. It was an issue that he didn't really know the father. And because he didn't really know the father, he wasn't able to interact with his brother the way that he was. And he was living in the father's house. 
which means I can be in the house and not know the father of the house. I can give to the father. I can serve for the father. I can work for the father and not know the father's heart. My prayer this Father's Day is that you would get a revelation of your heavenly father. That you would see him in a way, watch me, that makes you fall in love with him more, but makes you live differently. Write this down, write this down, write this down. With me isn't always with me. Just because you're, you're with me doesn't mean you're always with me. And it's, it's not funny and it's wrong and I'm working on it, but... There's some times where I'm talking to my wife and she's giving vision and we're unpacking things and all that other good stuff. And then she'll ask me, are you with me? And I'm like, yeah. Just repeat. The last 12 things you said, I'm locked in. I'm locked in. I just want, I just want to make sure that I'm clear. So just... Pray for me. God's still working on me. The older son, he said, Dad, I've been working tirelessly. When the brother came home, he was out in the field working. He was taking care of his father's position. He said, Dad, I've done all this for you. Which tells me working for someone doesn't make me fall in love with them. I can work for someone and admire their success and be grateful that they pay me. But that doesn't mean I know them, and it doesn't mean that I love them. You remember when Jesus went over to Lazarus' house, and Mary, Lazarus' sister, was sitting at Jesus' feet, listening to his teaching, and Martha was in the kitchen making beef stew and rice because she knew that Jesus really was Caribbean before the beginning of time. Different story for a different day. And Martha came out of the kitchen upset. She said, Jesus, I'm here working, slaving, cooking, so that you, the Son of God, can eat. And Mary is doing nothing. Here's what Jesus said. He said, it is good to serve me, but it is better to be with me. When you serve me, you build what I'm building. But when you're with me, you learn who I am. And I wonder how many of us as believers have spent, can I be honest, decades working for God. I'm sharing my faith. I'm, I'm giving my money. I'm, I'm, I'm serving in outreach. I'm, I'm doing this. I'm doing that. I'm doing this. It cannot be honest. And as mean as a snake. <laughs> yeah. Y'all know that song. I got the joy, 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 joy. Down in my heart. Where? Down in my heart. Where? You know why they wrote that song? Because they couldn't see the joy on Christian's face. <laughs> and they're like, where is it? It's down in my heart. Can you bring it up on your face? <laughs> We're working for a God that we don't actually know. And feel that the more we do for him, the more he'll bless us, the more he'll anoint us, the more he'll open doors for us, the more favor we'll receive from not realizing when Jesus, his son, came to earth and was baptized. Jesus said, this is my son. God the Father said, this is my son, whom I love and I'm well pleased. And Jesus had not healed one person, had not turned any water to wine, and had not died on the cross. And God the Father was sending us a message, my love and my aff aff affirmation. It's not based on your performance. It's based on your identity. That you're mine. And you were made in my image. Psalm 1611 says this. You will show me the path of life. He said, God the Father. Like, he doesn't desire you to go through life like blind Bartimaeus trying to find a career. And trying to find a spouse. And trying to find your destiny. and trying. He said, no. I will show you the path of where in my presence, in my presence, there's fullness of joy at my right hand are all the pleasures you could ever imagine. You think it's fun to be a party and be wasted? Wait till you get pleasures that can only come from God. Nothing else compares, but it's only found in his presence. 
I, I remember I, I felt called into the ministry when I was 16 and leading student ministry and all that other good stuff. And it was somewhere around 1920 that I really just feel like God would call me to do this for the rest of my life. I remember around that season, I started looking for a spiritual father, somebody that could just be a mentor and teach me faith and teach me ministry and just teach me all of this. I am blessed to have an amazing father. My dad is one of the greatest men I've ever met in my life, but there's something about someone who whoops your behind. You don't actually want them to be your spiritual father. It's just like, you know, you beat me, so I don't think God's anywhere in you, so... <laughs> Looking elsewhere. <laughs> and I remember, y'all remember that depressing Dr. Seuss book, Are You My Mother? Why do we read that foolishness to our kids? It's a little bird goes up to the crane, Are you my mother? Are you my mother? Are you my mother? Listen, I was that bird at 19. Are you my spiritual father? Are you my spiritual father? Are you my... just looking for someone to accept me? Someone to affirm the call of God on my life. And the more I search for a spiritual father, the more rejection I found. I mean, I carried bags. I drove to conferences. I gave offerings. I did everything that I could do to honor and could not find anybody to notice me at all. I remember after the exhaustion of just rejection after rejection after rejection, I said, you know what? Maybe all I need is God. Maybe if they don't want me, I don't want them. I'm just, and I'm telling y'all, I pressed into the presence of God for a season that has marked me for life. Doing dumb stuff like fasting for 21 days in July. Who does that? Like through July 4th. That's dumb. <laughs> Reading my Bible three, four times a year. Worshiping in my room and you know what happened? God started to heal the rejection issues in me. God started to affirm me. God began to beat the people pleaser out of me and taught me how to live for an audience of one. And you know what happened as God began to reveal himself to me as my heavenly father? spiritual fathers started coming from everywhere. I see this in you, and man, I'd love to invest in you. Man, this, and you know what I caught? By the way, life oftentimes is only understood in hindsight. In the moment, it feels like the whole world is against you. It's only when you're looking back that you realize what was really going on. Here's what was really going on. God was making sure that I wasn't accepted by any human until I found my acceptance in the Father, because he knew if I found my acceptance in a man before I sound acceptance in God. Watch this. I wouldn't make that man my God. And he says, I have everything for you, but I need you to know me and find me first. Because watch this, whatever your source of joy is will become your identity. And if you pick an identity that is unstable, you will be. So some people have picked their identity in their net worth. And now in this season of 13% inflation, you are unstable. <laughs> Come on now. Some people have made their identity their children. And when they pick the major that you didn't want them to pick, you are now stable. Some of you have made your spouse your identity. And when you found out that they are an individual with their own opinion, and it ain't your opinion all the time, now you're unstable. Some of you are saying, why haven't I gotten this? Why haven't... Do you know God will work against you for your good? It don't, it don't sound right, but it is right. God says, if you get that promotion before you get closer to me, that promotion will destroy you. I need you to know me. I got that on lock. Nobody's going to take it because it's yours, but I need you to know me. As a pastor, as a spiritual father of this house, I have the I say privilege. By the way, do you know the job of a spiritual father is to stand between demons and people? Pray for your pastor. I'm not even joking. 
Because everything that attacks you comes through my family first. I have the privilege to be a spiritual father for so many people. And, and, and I'll tell you this. I can always tell when a person has unhealed father wounds. Because it will normally manifest in one of two or three ways. One is they will have unrealistic expectations of me. And they will expect me to do things for them that only God the Father can do. Listen, I can't heal you, I can't define you, and I can't open doors for you. All I can do is point you to the one who can and give you an example of what it looks like to follow. Or I have people, because they've never known how to relate with a natural father, they, they, they're intimidated by authority, so their only option is now to challenge authority. I, I was out to lunch, this is years ago, I was out to lunch with a gentleman. He, y'all, y'all understand, I'm a pastor, but I'm stupid, I'm ignorant. This brother was saved for like three minutes, and I mean, that's, that's a stretch. <laughs> I don't even know if he'd gone to Grove Track. We went out to lunch, he said, Pastor, I've been praying about this lunch today, I've got some things to tell you. Great. <laughs> that was a lie. Um... Pastor, this is how we should do men's ministry. I think this is how men ministry should go. I know small groups are great. That's all cute and all that. But this is what men need. What are you doing? Checking how long you've been saved? Y'all know I'm ignorant. Don't come and tell me how to do what God's anointed me to do. Come and say, I too am a man under authority. Thus, I have authority. So where has God called me to live out the call of God on my life within this vision? I've discovered that if I don't first find my identity with God, I will never relate with my wife correctly, my children correctly, spiritual authority correctly, because I will look for every relationship in my life to either affirm me, make me feel like I'm more than I feel that I am, or whatever it may be. That's why the Bible says it's in God that we live and move and have our being. Can I give you just four quick things? Point number three, we're going to land this plane. Y'all know I'm not ending on time. I've been gone for four weeks, so got to get the kinks out. Okay. How do I spend time in God's presence? You ready? We're going to go through it quick. First thing you need to do is you need to hear from your father. Listen, your father wants to talk to you. The question is, are you listening? Well, what does he want to say? Well, he wants to tell you in Genesis 1, that you look just like him. He wants to tell you in Jeremiah 1, 5, that before you were even born, he knew you and had a plan and a purpose for you. He wants to tell you in Jeremiah 29, 11, hey, don't worry about the future. I know you don't know what it's going to look like, but I've seen it and it's better than you think it is. And it's for your good, not for your harm. He wants to tell you in the New Testament that your life is not happenstance, but he's called you to be an example to the world, an ambassador of heaven. He said no good thing will he keep from you as long as you walk in his image. So many things that the Father wants to say to us. The question is, are we... Somebody say, listen to the Father. Listen. Then the next thing you need, you need to talk. Here's what I think. I think the oldest son just never talked to his dad. And if he talked to him, y'all know those people you're beefing with, but you're like married to him, so you still got to be polite. <laughs> Come on now. Hey, listen, listen. There's some embargoes that happen in marriages that are better than any discord that's ever happened between countries. I mean, you walk by in the morning, good morning. Can you please pass the coffee? I mean, just polite as you And in that pass the coffee, it's sleep with one eye open. I feel like that's how the father was with his son. Dad, I'm going out to the field. But never, when's the last time you had a real conversation with your father? Not some prayer you memorize that good Christians pray. Father God, I'm thankful that you woke me up this morning. You set my feet on solid ground. The ground bent solid, okay? <laughs> When's the last time you prayed, God, I'm bored? 
grateful for my spouse. I'm grateful for my kids. I'm grateful for the job you've provided, but I feel like I haven't been challenged in years. God, is there anything else that you have for me that will make me feel alive? When's the last time you were real with your father? I need to hear from him. I need to talk to him. I need to worship him. The Bible says that God the Father, that he inhabits the praises of his people. Do you know that when you worship God, he shows up? When, when you declare that he's awesome and he's mighty and he's worthy? When you say, Jehovah Rapha, you're my healer, the healer shows up. When you say, Jehovah Jireh, you're my provider, the provider shows up. When you say, Jehovah Shalom, my peace, the peace of God that surpasses all understanding, that guards your heart and guards your mind shows up as you worship him is who he shows up as. That's why the Bible says I'm not going to let a rock or a worship team cry out in my name. Because when they worship, God is showing up for them. They're wor Nobody else can worship God on your behalf. So man, if I'm going to know who my father is, I'm going to have to learn to lock myself in my closet, threaten my kids. Don't you dare touch that door or I will make you disappear and make another one that looks just like you. Play with me. People are really worried about my kids. I got to learn how to get away at 6 a.m. on a Monday morning and lift my hands in my closet and say, God, you're my provider, my healer, my strong tower. The last thing you learn the heart of your father is by watching your father told you earlier, I, I'm, I'm just a gentleman. I open doors. I walk people to their cars. I, I lift bags. It's just how I am. My wife is all kind of put up on because she's, you know, I'm like, no, you're a woman. I'm just not saying you're weak, but I'm going to carry the groceries in the house. I got this. You're like, well, okay, go ahead and be a man then. <laughs> but I learned that watching my father. He never told me men carry groceries in the house, but he just always did. So I always did. How much do you watch your heavenly father? Do you watch how he deals with sinners? Not talking about their sin, but running towards them to cover them. Do you watch how he deals with the brokenhearted? That was not my mother that died. It was your mother that died, but I'm going to come and cry with you as if it was my mother, because when you're hurting, I'm hurting because that's what my father would do. Last thing is this. Write this down. Proximity means access. Proximity means access. Sean, you can play. Ushers, you can ush. <laughs> the son says, Dad, you have given me nothing. All that I've done for you, you've given me nothing. I wonder how many of us feel that about our father the first time he disappoints me. That love when we were praying to be healed that passed away makes us forget salvation, health. God, you've done nothing for me. And look what the father said. He said, of course I've given you nothing because everything I have is yours. Look at your neighbor and say, you missed it. Come on, let me say one. Everything I have is. Look at me again, because they ain't not that bright. They're not educated like you. Tell them, tell them, you missed it. Remember the younger son? When it says he came to his father and says, I want my inheritance. Go back and read it on your own time. Look what the Bible says. The Bible says that the father divided the inheritance amongst his sons. The oldest son got his two thirds. The same time the younger son got his one third. The father said, I didn't give you anything because it's all yours. You don't have to ask me to take what's already yours. You're upset because you didn't know what was yours and thus you didn't use what was yours. I wonder how many of us are asking God for healing, mad that he hasn't given it to us, not understanding that he said, by my stripes, you have been healed. I already gave you what you need. You just grab it by faith. I wonder how many of us are upset 
because God hasn't provided a spouse or a job or an open door and not understanding. Don't you know, I've already op- ordered your steps. I've already opened doors that no man can shut. It's already yours. We don't serve a father who's holding back on us. We serve a father that said, if I did not spare Jesus, my only son, but freely gave him, how much more will I not freely give you all things? Psalm 2, 7 says this, I will announce the Lord's decision. He said to me, you are my son. And today I've become your father. Just ask. Just ask. Don't be better, just ask. Don't try to do it on your own, just ask. And I will make the nations your possessions and the far corners of the earth will be your property. So many people struggle to ask God for more than they have because they feel like they don't deserve it. Made too many mistakes. I've prayed your little sinner's prayer and I went back and sinned. If you just knew who I was, I don't deserve. Here's what the younger son said. He said, people that aren't even my father's children live better than me. I was talking to one, someone, someone with time said, man, I just don't feel like I deserve to be blessed by God. I said, do you know how blessed ratchet people are? You ever seen some of these houses that heathens live in? (laughs) You ever see some of these jobs that God haters go to? It ain't been a deserved game in a long time. It has nothing to do with what you deserve. It has everything to do with who your father is. And your father says all that he has belongs to you. That it's your inheritance. My prayer is that this spirit of adoption would come on you. That this rejected spirit of being an orphan would come off on you. And you'd begin to live your life as if he is my father. And he's a good father. And he has all that I need and more. Father God, we are grateful that we get to call you father. Honestly, we start prayers with Father God kind of out of religion. But for some reason on this Father's Day, it hits just a little different. We're grateful that you are our Father. God, I pray right now that you would break off a spirit of rejection. Break off an orphan spirit. And bring on us the confidence that it means to be sons and daughters of the Most High God. Robert, you're sitting here. If you could pray this prayer with me, say, Holy Spirit. What are you saying to me? (laughs) And just give God a moment to make this message personal to you. I know what he's saying to all of us. We need to do better at loving others. If we really say we love him, then it got to be reflected in the way we treat others. But for some of you, if you'd be honest, at Flowers, at Columbia, Baltimore, watching online, wherever you are, literally all over the world, if you'd be honest, you'd say, Pastor, I'm, I'm that prodigal. I'm the one that took the health and the provision and all that God's given me and I ran out and I used it to live for myself. And I want to come back home. You got to understand the father that you have. When you take one step towards him, he'll run 50 miles towards you. He's literally just waiting for you to turn to him. And for so many of you, this is going to be your prodigal moment. If you say, Pastor, I've been living on my own, but I need him in my life. Right where you're sitting, right where you're watching. Pray this prayer with me. Say, Father God. Come on, say it with faith. Say, Father God, thank you for loving me. Thank you for giving your son Jesus to die on the cross so that all of my mistakes, all my sins, be forgiven. Today, I'm coming home. I give you all of me. Be my Lord, be my Savior, and use me for your glory. In Jesus' name, 
Amen and amen and amen. Come on. Can you celebrate for every...